right? So in this lecture, we are going to talk about economic growth, right? So just quick, quick, quickly review what we have learned. So we are in the second module. Right? In the first module, we review microeconomics. In the second module, so the key things is understand the measurement. So we have just learned how to measure in GDP, and then we learn how to measure in the price level. Now this chapter, so we are going to look at economic growth, right? And so this is going to be roadmap for this chapter. So we are going to look at what we mean long-run economic growth, but that largely that is, that is measured by real GDP per capita, right? And then, so we are going to study what are the factors or the key contributors to long-run economic growth so that explain, that's so that understand, so why some country richer than the other, right? Or why, so there's some country outperform the others over long-term. And lastly, we are going to look at sustainability and the challenge to growth. So essentially it's about like climate change, like the, uh, deple the depletion of our natural resource, right? So that's a roadmap. Now let's just first look at economic growth, right? So the economic growth, it has the cost and its benefit. Usually we pay attention to the benefit, okay? So essentially because economic growth brings us prosperity, brings us higher and higher standard of living. So that's both in terms of quantity and quality. But less attention has been paid to the cost associated with economic growth, okay? So usually come with the cost of air pollution. It comes as the cost of climate change. It comes at the cost of the depletion of natural resource. And also it comes with the cost of inequality, okay? lost jobs, so on and so forth, or poverty, right? Okay. Now, but nevertheless, let's just first understand what we mean economic growth and why some country grow better than the other. Right? So we have seen the growth for United States. So that's this line, right? So if we look at US alone, so during the past century, there was significant growth from here to here, okay? So we saw the number before. So roughly, so the per capita GDP increased eightfold during the past century, right? But certainly there's fluctuation. So this Great Depression, this is World War II. Now we want to put the US growth in a bigger context. We compare our experience with other two countries. Here is China, the other is India. Right? Then you can see over the long term, so things can change. They're both inside one country and across board. Right? And from here, so you can see what the pattern we can see. So both China and India is kind of catching up with the United States, or the gap is start to narrow. But the the experience or the pace are different. And there are at least two questions. Question number one, what explain the gap between United States and the rest of the world? Question number two, so what explain narrowing the gap? Right, so that's kind of the goal we are trying to achieve in this chapter. But first, let's look at these questions so that we appreciate the importance of looking at GDP per capita instead of look at total GDP. Suppose real GDP for Macronesia is 200 million in 2010. Suppose population is 100,000 in 2010 and the population grow to 105,000 in 2011. At the same time, GDP grow by 5%. Sorry. Now, the question asks you, what happened to real GDP per capita? Certainly the answer is C, stay constant. Why? Because yes, the total GDP increased by 5% here. But in the meantime, 
the population grow by 5%. Meaning, so your GDP growth will be exactly offset by population growth. Meaning if we look at per capita term, there's nothing change in your per capita GDP. Right, so they just highlight, so if we look at total GDP, we are gonna have a distorted view because some of the GDP growth may come from population growth. But if you look at per person term, if you look at standard living, nothing change, right? So we need to look at per person. But of course, so here we look at real instead of nominal. Just remind yourself the early example I showed, right? So Venezuela, if we look at nominal term, so their GDP growth was spectacular. But in reality, not much change in terms of their standard living and even worse, perhaps decline. Right? But why their nominal GDP increase is because the high inflation, right? So that just tell us we should look at real GDP or so we look at real GDP per capita. Right? Now this just tells you what happens during the past century for US economy. We comparing 1900 to 2010. So if we look at 1900 as a benchmark, now you can see this increase bound from 100% to 758. So this is roughly eight fold increase. Or alternatively, we can normalize 2010 as 100. Now you can see 1900, the standard living is roughly 10% of what we have today, right? So that just tells you there is a significant growth over time, okay? And then these slides show you there is quite different growth experience across the world, right? Look at here, so we use darker color for higher income. And then we use lighter color for low income. But just look at this number. So low income is very, very low. So that is essentially translated into $3 per day. All right. And then so you can see so America here, West Europe here, and Australia, those are relatively rich country. The poor country are central in Africa some part of Asia and certainly it's the South America. So they are doing poor, poorly compared to uh, North America. But a certainty, so the main takeaway from this picture is that there's wide range of difference in terms of their economic growth. But we need to find out what are the main factors behind this difference. So first let's look at some algebra, okay? So I'm going to introduce a rule of 70. So this rule of 70 says, okay, so if a variable, so you can think about this is the growth of population or this is the growth of per capita GDP as we care. Okay? Or if the growth of the price, whatever, whatever uh, interesting. So if the growth rate is X percent, then it's going to take 70 divided by this X percent to double your income or to double the verbal you are interested in. Like in our case, the income, right? Example. If real GDP per capita is growing at an annual growth rate of 3.5%, it's gonna take 70 divided by 3.5 equal to 20 years, okay? So you may be wondering how we came up with this 70, rule of 70, okay? So let's just quickly explain to you. So essentially this just says, okay, so you need to find out one plus, okay, X is our percentage. Right? And then, so raise the power of N. So this is compounding. 
right? It took n years. So then, so you double your income, okay? So this is what, so n is the object we need to find out. And then you take a log on both sides. Okay, if you're familiar with calculus, and then so you can log and then take some approximation. So at the end, you're gonna see X will be, a pro, sorry, uh, N, apologize. So N will, approximate, will be approximate by, so this number is gonna be log two divided by X percent. So that's just translated into rule of 70. All right, so if, you, if you're not familiar with these maths, don't worry, so that's not essential. These are just to provide a background for students who are interested. So the key message here is you need to know this part. 70 divided by X, X is your growth rate. Now let's look at example. Suppose real GDP grow 2%. How many year will it take for real GDP to approximately double? So the answer is straightforward, right? So 70 divided by two. So that's what we just learned. All right, so this one is straightforward. Now, this one is less straightforward. Okay, let me give you 30 minutes to think about, and then so we can, we can look at how we are gonna solve this problem, okay? All right, so there are two countries, right? India, current per capita GDP is 3,000. Growth rate is 5%. Italy, 24,000. So essentially this question asks you, so how long does it take for India to catch up with the current level of Italy? Or in other words, how long does it take for India to grow from 3,000 to 24,000? Okay, so this is this question. Now, the growth rate is 5%, right? So we need to take the following step to address this question. Step number one. From 3,000 to 24,000, what is the gap? Or what, how many fold you need to increase? The answer is clear, right? So, so you would must grow eight, per, eight times, right? So, eight, sorry. so you need to grow eight times, right? And then second, so in order to reach eight times, so you need to double how many times? Okay, so you need to double three times, right? So two times two times two, that equals eight. Okay, you need to double three times. So, or in other words, in these examples, so India needs to double their income three times so that they can reach the level of Italy, right? So double three times. Now, step number three. So take how many years for India to double once? The answer is 70 divided by five, which is 14, right? Okay, last step. So take how many years for India to reach the level of Italy? Like we just, we just uh, mentioned, right? So it takes, 14 years to double once. Now we need to double three times. And that just means, okay, so eventually, so you need to, you need, you need uh, double 
uh, so you need to double three times, it's going to take uh, 14 times three, right? Because 14 years, you double once. And another 14 years, you double twice. And then so another 14 years, double the third time. So you double three times, so you can reach from 3,000 to 24,000. Okay, and then so 14 times three, so the answer is going to be 42, right? So that's how we get this number, okay? All right, so here, so we can look at growth through another aspect, right? So earlier we just show the income level okay, across, across countries. Now here we look at growth rate across countries. So on the far left, we have China here. So the growth rate is almost 8%. On the far right, we have Zimbabwe. So the growth rate is negative. Now, if we apply the rule of 70, see what this means. So this just means for China, it's going to take them one decade to double their income, right? So remember for the uh, for United States, it take us one century to increase our income by eightfold. But I, now, so for, for Chinese economy, so they can reach that goal in 30 years, right? Because eight, you need double income three times. So they can double their income in a decade. And then in three decades, they can reach the goal of eightfold increase. So that's the power of economic growth, right? But the certainty is so whether they can sustain this growth, that's a different question. Like currently, so everyone's kind of uh, agree or there's a consensus. So their growth is start to decline. But that's a different question, right? But it's for now, let's just say, let's just appreciate the importance of these growth or the compounding, right? On the other hand, so if you look at Zimbabwe, so that just means eventually their economy is going to improve, right? And then furthermore, so we look at Argentina earlier. So we compare Argentina with Canada, right? And here, so you can see, so Argentina growth rate is very low, right? Because okay, so that's also expense. So why, so in early example, so, so Argentina starts the 20th century similar to Canada, but end up with only a third of what is the standard living in Canada, right? And then, so we can look at an example. So India, so earlier we show the growth of India compared with China, compared with the United States, right? So yes, India's overall growth was good, but since 1980, so their uh, growth rate start to stagnate or start to slowing down. But what's behind those slowing down in growth? So possible explanation is because lack of education and infrastructure. But why lack of education and infrastructure matters growth? So that's going to be the next topic we are going to study. Okay, the source of long run growth. To understand long run growth, first we need to understand labor productivity. So this is output per worker. So this is closely related to long run growth. And you can even approximate long run economic growth by looking at labor productivity, right? But what it determines or what matters to labor productivity? So economies have exam data over time and across countries. And we've identified the following factors that are crucial in improving our labor productivity. Okay. So this includes the first one is physical capital. But what is physical capital? Physical capital are human-made resources, such as buildings and machines. So use our 
clause as example, the computer I use is physical capital. The building I'm using, they are physical capital. So why the physical capital is so important? Just imagine without the building, okay? In the cold winter or in the hot summer, so we may not able to hold the clock. And without this uh, computer, and then everything must write on the board, either the white board or the black board, right? And then, so the productivity is going to be very, very low, right? Just imagine, just take, take a long time for me to write those sentences, write those definitions on the black board or the white board. But now with computer, we can pre-tap those things and in the class, I just present you to those material, explain to you the key message, and then you go back, go home, and then study yourself. All right, so this physical capital help us to improve the productivity. Right, this is first, first factor. Second factor, human capital. So what is human capital? So largely this is education, and knowledge embedded in the workforce. Okay, use our class as example. Okay, what is human capital? Human capital essentially is a skill, experience, knowledge I have from a past experience, okay, through my teaching at the different institutions, through my rich experience in central bank and the government agency. So those things is going to help me to give you better understanding or better explanation. So those things help me help me to help you to connect what we learn in class. Usually are very abstract concepts. So link them to real world phenomena. Right? So that's human capital. But eventually, so you the education you receive. The skill you acquire, the knowledge you have by attending my class will help you to be a better worker, okay? To improve your productivity once you graduate from college. So this is human capital. Now, the third factor is called technological progress. So this is uh, advanced in the way we produce Right? Just think about electricity. So that's a big innovation or big technology progress. Right? And then think about internet. Think about computer. Those are big technological progress. That has fundamentally changed how we live and has fundamentally changed how we work and how we produce. Right? So those, those are the examples and their importance. Now, we have identified three important factors. Okay? The next, we want to set up a connection between input and the output. But what is input and what is output here? The output essentially is productivity, or essentially is how much each worker can produce in our economy. So this output. But what are inputs? Input are just those three factors we just identified. So this includes technology, physical capital, and the human capital, right? And then, so we end up with this aggregate production function. So this is a hypothetical function that links those input to our output. Link those factors matters to labor productivity to labor productivity itself, right? So to be more specific, so this is the function uh, in the middle. On the left hand side, we have GDP per worker. So this is our output. And earlier we, we call this labor productivity. On the right hand side, so there are three factors. Factor number one, this is physical capital per worker. 
Factor number two, human capital per worker. And a factor number three, T. T here stands for technology, right? And the next, so we have a parameter here, 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So essentially this number indicate the importance of physical capital also indicate the importance of human capital, right? So usually the larger the number, the more important this number, uh, this, this factor, right? So now with this production function, we are ready to address the early question we had. What explain the income difference across countries? Why United States, is more advanced than pretty much the rest of the world. But the similarly, so we can ask why China can grow so fast, right? Why the Indians um, economic growth slowed down? So the answer also lies in this equation, right? Just imagine if you have one country, so they have lots of physical capital compared to other, and we hold T and a human capital fixed, and a certainty that country is going, going, to in, uh, going to grow faster or their income is going to higher. On the other hand, if one country has higher technology level, okay, or the economy is more innovative, and then certainly, so they're going to have higher G per worker, right? Okay, so for this production function, so we have a very interesting and very important property. Okay? So this is called a diminution return to physical capital. So this diminution return to physical capital will have profound impact on long run economic growth. But let me first explain to you what is diminution return to physical capital. And then next, I'm going to explain to you what that means to long run economic growth, right? So this diminution return to physical capital says, so you have additional capital helps, but once we acquire more and more physical capital, and then the additional unit or the marginal unit of physical capital is going to bring us less and less productivity gain. Just to give you an example. If we give the lecture without a computer, and then so I must write everything on the board, very slow, right? So, and then one day, so we introduce this computer with the help of the projector and the internet. And then suddenly, so the productivity is going to boost, right? Or in other words, in one hour, I can give more, content or give more presentation than I used to without this computer. Now, just imagine if I have another computer, another projector. Yes, it may marginally help, but the gain, I mean, the productivity gain from the second computer is gonna be minimal. Right, so that just reflects a diminution return to physical capital. Now, another example. So for a person who don't have a car, they must rely on public transportation or walk or ride a bicycle. And then the car is going to improve your mobility. You can do more, right? So you have more freedom, you can go further, right? But however, will the second car help you a lot? Not really. It help, but the margin of, again, in your productivity will be minor, right? So this also reflects diminution return to physical capital, right? So I gave you two examples, but then, so I'm going to show you the intuition and explain you 
the implication of this diminishing return on this diagram. First, I want to highlight, so we usually, we are good at understanding two dimension. In three dimensions, it becomes difficult and almost impossible if you go to four dimension or higher. Uh, and now, so how we end up with here? So essentially here, we fix T and we fix human capital. We only show the relationship between productivity and physical capital. I should keep that in mind. For the moment, we keep T and a human capital fixed. We only show the relationship between physical capital and the real GDP per worker, right? Now we are going to see this red curve. So first, this is an increasing function. More physical capital we have, the more we can produce. Now, secondly, this curve becomes flatter and flatter. Okay. So what that means, this actually reflects diminution return to physical capital. So we move from zero to 20,000. We gain productivity by 30,000. Now we move from A to B, so we add 30,000 of capital. The gain is 20,000. So this 20, okay, so to, to, to better compare, now we move to B to C. So we add another 30,000, right? So this, this is easier to compare. So we add another 30,000. So what is the gain productivity? So you only gain 10,000 versus 20,000. So it's like slowing down, right? Okay, so this flattening of the curve reflects diminution return to physical capital. Now, let me explain to you what this means or what's the implication to economic growth. Right? So if we trying to put two country in this diagram, so for example, US versus Mexico, right? So let me write down. So if we put US versus Mexico, right? and the, a reasonable way to put is US gonna be here, Mexico is gonna be here. So this just reflects in reality. So US has a higher capital stock per worker and the US has higher labor productivity per worker than Mexico, right? So this is a reasonable way to put that. Now, if we are trying to think about for each country, if they add additional $1 of physical capital, which country is going to benefit more? So now, so the diminution return to physical capital starts to kick in. US has higher physical capital than Mexico. And then the diminution return to physical capital immediately implies for US, so this one dollar is going to bring you less. But this same one dollar in Mexico is going to generate more. Okay, so this less and more is in terms of real GDP per worker. Or in other words, so US is going to experience lower GDP grows than Mexico, simply because US has higher capital stock. And then so you have this diminution return to physical capital. Right, so that's what this diminution return to physical capital means. But uh, however, it made too earlier to reach a conclusion says US is going to enjoy a lower productive, uh, sorry, lower productive gain. Why? It's because here, so the entire analysis, we assume T is fixed. We assume human capital is fixed. But in reality, 
So U.S. is going to have higher T and also most likely is going to have higher growth rate in T. So that means, that means, so in reality, so you're going to see a, sorry. So I can draw that. It seems like I haven't put that in this slide yet. So that just means for the U.S. So we may end up with, so this is how it's going to happen. So we'll end up with here. That just means, okay, so for Mexico, they grow from A to B. But for U.S. is going to from, grow from B to a point here. Right? So if both U.S. and Mexico has the same T and the same human capital, yes, U.S. certainly is going to grow slower. But the reality is the U.S. is going to have higher T and a better human capital. So this also tells us the importance of other dimension, right? So physical capital, it is important, but the other things also matters. Right, but well, nevertheless, here, so this diminution return, what this diminution return means, right? And what, particularly what that implies to economic growth, okay? Oh yeah, so here, sorry. So Mexico is going to grow from A to B, but then, so U.S. is going to grow from B to D, all right? Okay, so now we have, uh, rough idea what is behind the economic growth what explains the difference of growth across country right and we have learned this uh, aggregate production function now we can use this aggregate production function to do an exercise or counting exercise this is called growth accounting Essentially, so this growth accounting is just going to decompose the growth in change in T, which is technology, change in physical capital, okay, and then change in human capital. So this is growth accounting. So those are three factors, right? And then, say, for example, we observe U.S. economic growth eight hundred percent during the past century. This growth accounting is going to tell you. What's the contribution of this factor? What is this one? And what is this one? Right? And this exercise is going to give us a total factor of activity. So actually, this is going to give us a measure of technology. Because usually, in reality, we observe capital. We can measure in your human capital. But in terms of technology, is less easy to directly measure, right? We can only direct, indirectly measuring technology through digital growth accounting, right? So actually, so you're going to learn this in details once you move to more advanced class. For now, just understand there's a growth accounting that can help us to decompose the contribution of each factor to the observed economic growth. All right. All right. So here I want to highlight technology and the productivity. So they are closely related. And the technology change is crucial to economic growth. Right. And then what about the other aspect? Right. So this includes human capital and physical capital. But this usually is compared with natural resource, right? So in modern economy, the most important factor for lower economic growth is technology. The least important factor is natural resource. In the middle, human capital and physical capital, so they play a more important role than natural resource, but it's less important than feed uh, than technology, right? So in history, so by the way, so there's a famous comment, Robert Gordon, he has mentioned, so we have experienced five big innovation. So this includes electricity during early 20th century, the internal combustion engine 
that's even earlier, right? So that's during the uh, Industrial Revolution. Running water and central heating. So that, again, that's in 19th century. Modern chemistry. So that includes antibiotics, right? And the last three, so mass communication, movie, and the telephone. So that including the introduction of, or the invention of TV, computer, internet. Uh, he basically, he believed those are the five bigger innovation we have experienced. But unfortunately, he also believed, so we are entering the decline, right? So there is a dramatic increase in growth rate since the industrial revolution. But then, so we kind of exhaust the new idea, right? So whether this is true or not, so we will see what happened in the, in the next couple of decades. But at least here, the message is, so we have benefited tremendously from technology, from innovation, right? But then the next question, oh, by the way, so this slide just highlight the importance of economic growth. So we compare it to neighboring country. And so we look at their satellite image during the night, right? So one country is pretty light at all, like, like we do, but the other country is pretty much dark during the night. They cannot afford, right? So that is one indicator. One hard evidence shows economic growth matters a lot. Now, we may be wondering, so what can contribute to growth? So certainly, so everything must go to the factors we identify, either as technology or physical capital or human capital. Whatever is good to either of those three factors <laughs> is gonna be good for economic growth. Now let's go one by one. Saving and investment. So that's going to help us to build up physical capital, right? So that's good. Education. So that's going to improve human capital. It's also necessary or also needed. Research and development. So that's going to encourage technology innovation, right? So that is crucial, right? But the, I want to emphasize the policy that it can, that it can help further technology innovation. But first, what is R&D? So R&D is the spending to create and implement new technology, right? So, but I want to emphasize R&D is very risky. Why it is risky? It is risky in following two sets. Number one, so the inventor or the developer, so they don't know which one will work. Like in this background picture shows, Thomas Edison, the inventor of modern light bulb. So he didn't know which one work best or he didn't know which one actually will succeed. So it's very risky, right? So you, you may end up with no answer. This risk number one. Risk number two. So again, use Thomas Edison as example. He also invent electricity, right? But during his time, so there's another person also invent electricity, but in different form, which is Tesla, right? So what's the difference? So Thomas Edison, he invent, we call AC, right? Sorry, he invented DC. And um, Tesla, he invent AC. So what's the difference between AC and DC? So DC is, so the power is constant, but AC is alternate. But what's the advantage of AC versus DC or DC versus AC? So the main advantage of AC is, so it's easier for long distance electricity transportation, right? And 
So that's another risk, right? Because you do not know which one will be adopted by the market, even though both work, right? So given this risk, and then so we may need, so let's just go to these slides. So, and then so we may need the help of the government policy. So the government policy can encourage or even can facilitate the R&D so that we can come out with better and new ideas to promote economic growth, right? So what are those government policy? This includes government in subsidy to infrastructure, but just going to help uh, uh, physical capital, right? The government subsidy to education. So that's, include, that's going to help the human capital accumulation. And then lastly, we are going to need government subsidy to R&D because R&D is risky, right? And then, so we need to maintain a well-functioning financial system so that the uh, inventors, they are willing to do the R&D, right? So on top of that, a financial system, a well-functioning financial system is also going to help other aspects like physical capital and education. Just look, use education as an example. In the United States, we have student loans, right? So this student loan is going to help millions of students to get higher education, to acquire more knowledge, to become a better worker. But without this student loan, so it's probably millions of students will lose opportunity to go to college, right? So besides this policy, so we may need the protection of property rights so that those inventors, entrepreneurs, we need to take the risk to invent, right? And then so we need the political stability and a good, good governance so that people is willing to carry risky investment, right? And here, this, there's a background picture, just like case studies show you the importance of the infrastructure. So this is a Roman aqueduct. So that's been built 2,000 years ago. Okay? So this, the building of this infrastructure improved agriculture in that region quite significantly. Okay? So this is a case study. All right. So now, yes, yeah, so here, so there are two examples or case studies. Why? One is why uh, Britain fought behind. The other is what caused East Asia's miracle, okay? So I leave this two case study for you to read, but essentially it's echo the policy we just mentioned, right? So you need a good policy to encourage saving investment. You need a good policy to encourage education and R&D, right? So whenever you have a government, so their policy is against those things, you're going to see a decline growth. And otherwise, you're going to see economic miracle, as we observe in East Asia. All right, I leave that for you to read. Now, in close, so let me see. So we can look at Africa. Let's just expand a little bit. Put some words. Right. So Africa. So as we saw earlier, their growth wasn't very good, and the most of part has negative growth. Right? What is behind? the negative growth in Africa, okay? So there are, there are a couple of uh, factors. Government corruption, war, instability. And some may argue, so unfavorable geography, that leads to the prevalence of infectious disease. So that's going to reduce the human capital, right? And then there's a big question people like to ask. Is African poor? because of its politics are very unstable, or is it because their political uh, system is unstable so that they are poor? This is a very difficult question to untangle because it's like causality, right? But nevertheless, the good news right now is, so the growth rate in sub Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, so that was considered the least developed part in the world is picking up, okay? So that's a piece of good news. 
All right, so this slide just uh, tells us the convergence hypothesis, okay? So this convergence hypothesis coming from diminution return to physical capital. Right, earlier I showed you the example, right? So UK, uh, US versus Mexico. Right, so Mexico supposed to have higher growth rate compared to the United States, largely because they have lower capital stock and then so they're gonna enjoy higher return to physical capital, right? So we want to bring this idea to worldwide economy. So on the left hand side, it seems like this story is true. The poor you are on the I'll go to this side, the higher your growth rate. The richer you are, the lower your growth rate. Right? So this just reflects the diminution return to physical capital. The richer you are, you have more physical capital. The more physical capital you have, the lower return you're going to see. Right, so this seems correct. But however, if we expand our data set, and then, so we go to the right-hand side, then the picture becomes, becomes very noisy or loudy. What is behind picture B versus picture A? Remember earlier, when I explained to you the diminishing return, so physical capital, we say, okay, so we fix T and fix human capital as constant. But in reality, so the country not only differ in their physical capital, they also differ in human capital measured by education and they differ in technology, right? So what that means is, so US, Income is very high, but they also have high technology and a better education. So that's why US, so they still enjoy a higher growth rate compared to Africa, right? To summarize, so this convergence hypothesis will hold among countries who are similar, but only different in physical capital. So this convergence hypothesis will fail if we look at broad spectrum of economies. Right? But nevertheless, this convergence hypothesis is very important. Right? It gives us some hope. So the poor country is gonna catch up as long as they keep investing in human capital and the technology and also keep saving and invest. Right? So now let's look at these practice questions. Economic growth can be especially fast. So actually both, so actually A, B, and C, they are all correct. But countries playing catch up with countries that already have higher real GDP per capita. So this actually just reflects the diminution return to physical capital. B, for relatively poor countries, if converging hypothesis hold true, right? When these hypothesis hold true, so you need those countries have similar technology and human capital. See if a country is able to benefit from adopting the technology advance already used in advanced countries. So essentially you just increase your technology. Right, so that's a crucial thing. All right. So D is correct. Now we have a video to watch. So let me just quickly go through the Lost topic, and then so we watch this video together, right? So the lots of things left in this chapter is about sustainable long-run economic growth. 
So while we look at this sustainability, this is because at least two things, or maybe three. First, natural resource is limited. But a natural resource, even though it's not crucial, but still, so we need natural resource for economic growth, right? So in modern days, natural resource, including minerals, including metals, including oil, right? So those are limited. So if we keep growing, so we are going to use more and more natural resource. Now the question is whether we have the natural resource in 50, 100, or 200 years. So number one. Number two, the growth usually come at the cost of pollution, right? And so this pollution, whether it make our economy sustainable or not, because could it be so the pollution is going to damage our health. The pollution is going to damage our environment. At some point, so you find out, so this pollution is just too hard to, to, to bear. And so you may find out so the growth is may not worse the cost. It's number two. And then number three is climate change. And so this is go beyond pollution, right? So essentially, so we grow, we consume, and we burn those energy. We, uh, uh, we emit CO2. So the climate has permanent change. So the severe weather has become more frequent. The planet becomes inhabitable. And then nothing is meaningless. Oh, sorry, nothing is meaningful, right? So there are at least three reasons why we need to talk about sustainability of economic growth, right? But by the way, so sustainable long-run growth means long-run growth that can continue considering we have limited supply of natural resource. And also considering the fact, so our growth has impact on environment, both in terms of pollution, that's in short term, and the climate change in long term or in larger scale, right? So what is sustainable? Meaning so, okay, so we are not going to exhaust our natural resource. We are not going to make our environment inhabitable, but at the same time, so we keep our growth, right? To show you why this is matters, so let me just show you some evidence, okay, like here. So over time, our economy grow. We've seen, we have seen this many times. In the meantime, oil consumption is gonna pick up. So there's a hiccup, so it's a decline. But over the long term, it's increasing. Right, so there's a trend we are going to exhaust our natural resource. But also just keep in mind, so the more oil we consume, the more CO2 we are, we are going to emit, the higher the temperature, the less habitable of our, our planet, right? And then, so if we look at cross country, so you can see, so this is the United States, this is Europe, this is China, right? But so the good news is, so economists realize the importance. The policy makers, they realize the damage and they also realize the cooperation is necessary, right? And then they start to take some action. But in terms of economics, in terms of this class, so I'm going to explain to you what we have done in terms of economic measure to make the growth sustainable. But essentially the key idea is we need people to aware their action is going to cause the depletion of natural resource. Their action or the economic growth is gonna come, come a cause of pollution. But usually, so they're not internalize the cause, right? And then, so this what economy has discovered or invented. First, they have carbon tax. So what is that? Say for example, the Apple, they produce so many iPhones. Throughout the pro production of iPhones, 
So they are going to create a lot of CO2. And then, so the government says, okay, so you are free to emit CO2, but for each pound of CO2, so I'm going to levy a tax. So before there's no such tax, they are free to emit. You have to rely on their morality to reduce the CO2 emission. Now this tax is going to change their incentive. All right, this is number one. Number two, there's a cap and a trade system. Very similar. The difference is, okay, so now instead of a charge tax, so now the government says, okay, so okay, I still use Apple. So this year I'm going to award you, so if you give them hundred tons of CO2, if you can create, uh, can produce in a cleaner way. So you have additional carbon emission. You can sell to other polluter. On the other hand, so if you cannot produce in a cleaner way, and you can purchase from other clean producer. But if you find out the cost is too high, then your only option is you need to cut your production to meet this standard. Right, similar to tax. But in either case, so that just give them incentive to think a cleaner way to produce, to reduce carbon emission. But why we want to reduce carbon emission we want our growth is sustainable. We don't want to hurt our climate. We don't want to reach a point, there's no return. All right, so that is finished this part of this uh, lecture. So now let's just watch this video all together. So this is about growth and what long run growth can bring us. Right. <laughs> 